Love and Ghost kind of started with that. It, well, basically, with, this is actually a probably pretty good example. Um, just how I came about my Love and Ghost. I got my original founding mail that kind of had some like yellow greenish coloration, uh, yellow greenish coloration, um, higher yellow belly. And I ended up breeding them to just kind of like a normal looking wild type female. And I got some babies right away that were actually pretty bright yellow. And I thought that was, you know, of course, I was like, wow, that's really cool that this showed up so quick. Um, some of these characteristics from the father. And the mom kind of looked more like somewhat normal. But all the babies had a degree of yellow, some more than others. And oh. so I kept those back. And I started uh, line breeding those. But through that process, I actually incorporated yellows um, and snakes that looked like that they would um, complement that the kind of whole lemon ghost uh, project. So I remember I picked up this really cool yellow phased male from in Daytona when I was like 15. And um, this guy, I remember he had a big clutch of hog, uh, you know, big clutch from a hog nose. And a lot of the babies had some yellowish and he had a couple that were way more yellow than the others. So I purchased one of those. Um, I remember I purchased some really nice uh, yellowish hog nose from Richard Evans that came from his jungle project. I purchased those. Um, and I definitely got some blonde phase and a couple others. And uh, so then I had pretty good diversity as I was lion breeding. And I got some like, you know, different ranges. But as um, I kept lion breeding, you know, you started getting some pretty good uh, consistency. <laughs> so and then that's at that point, I started kind of coining the name of the project, like Lemon Ghost. Um, and once you have like a pretty good like. Uh, gene pool like of like various hoggles like that you can actually cross them back and forth quite a few times and so you know i've been working with like selectively lime breeding and lemon ghost for about like 20 years and uh haven't really had any issues i did uh, a couple times experiment and go to like like f2 and f3 and i started noticing like you know when we went up to f3 you might start getting like slightly like shorter faces or um you know a couple minor defects so then i don't really i don't do that anymore so i have quite a few um uh, lemon ghost actually they're kind of like almost like three or four separate lines and some are outcrossed and i have some that are outcrossed in extreme purple red and i end up breeding them back into like lemon ghosts you know or animals from the lemon ghost project that have high percentages of that original line bred gene okay and so for those who are new to reptiles and breeding what what is f1 and f2 what what do you mean when you say that uh, those are the first generations of breeding a uh, brother and sister together so um that's like considered more like inbreeding there is some inbreeding that occurs in the wild with like locale populations so it's really not bad to do you just don't want to do it too much like there's certain species where i've seen it with people with leopard geckos go up to like f12 with um no issues and i've seen it with corn snakes people going up like f7 f8 f9 um hog nose i don't think they do deal quite as well with uh like longer term inbreeding so i don't really ever go i would never really go too much past like f2 i think f2 is kind of like good and then you want to do some outcrossing and some of those issues too i've seen with f3 because i didn't really do uh probably a large enough sample size with that um test you know breeding and everything where you can actually determine say that was the actual cause it may have been something else um but you know i didn't try to find out if that was the issue i would assume that they can go further than that because if you look where hognose are in the wild there are isolated populations and there's almost little pockets of them on these uh very habitats. So there's probably a good deal of, um, you know, some inbreeding going on in the wild for sure. Okay. And so with your, your lemon ghost line, uh, at what point did you start noticing the Woma pattern and where do you think that came from? Um, well, you know what? It's funny. I've actually seen some Woma like hog nose, um, in like, uh, from pictures of wild hog nose people have found before they're, they're uncommon, but I've seen a couple where it's like, Oh wow, that's got, that kind of woma ring uh, pattern and, and it's not ringed like a tiger it's ringed like like a woma but it popped up the first ones when i was like around like 18 or 19 and it's probably a combination of just line breeding a bunch of various looking high yellow hognose into my base project and there was basically probably an existing um pattern anomaly that can be expressed from wild types, such as like I just mentioned, like, you know, I've seen one, I've seen a couple from the wild people found that look like Womas. So that means that's a, you know, an expression that could be found even in wild populations. And 
in the late 90s, early 2000s, almost all these hognos were not many generations from wild populations. And so, and I know my lemon ghost wasn't. My, actually, my first two pair of hognos I ever bred, I know they were both wild caught. And, you know, the hobby's come a long way now. Now you have pretty much like no wild caught, and there's not really any necessary or need for them. And there's a lot of, you know, everything obviously is mostly captive born. It's very, actually, it's hard to find anything that's wild caught or even first generation from wild caught. But it started popping up around like 18 or 19 and it started with just kind of like triangular, kind of like a uh, shaped like diamond pattern up around the side of the neck mostly. Um, some had a little wider blotching and I think those are cool. So I'm going to read those. And it wasn't really until I was probably about 23. So about like, you know, like 10, 11 years ago where I started getting some that had really nice thick banding. Um, maybe a couple, maybe a year or two before then. And, uh, yeah, I think it was more around when I was like 20, 21, where I started seeing some pretty decent ones. But by the time I was 23, 24, I was producing full ringed Womas. But I was already calling them Womas before that. Okay. And so where did you get the name Woma from? Because it kind of looked like a Woma python. Is that, is that yes. where you got it from? Yeah. And also because like hmm. the ball python, I was always, always a fan of watching the ball python hobby and all the genes popping up. And there was a Woma ball python. And uh, I think it's Kevin McCurley came up with the, that term for that uh, gene and i thought that was a pretty cool name and i thought it applied and uh i probably should have taken a name <laughs> so you know elsewhere but i mean actually you don't really see the woma gene being talked about too much in the ball python hobby anymore it's not utilized as you know that frequently anymore that was uh more of a somewhat subtle gene although there's a hidden gene woma that one's uh a lot more uh abundant and commonly used but the original um Woma, you don't really see or to hear too much about that gene anymore. All right. And so in terms of your lemon goals, since you've been line breeding them for 20 years, do you think you've maxed out the yellow color saturation or like where where do you see that project going maybe in the next three to five years? Um, actually, I think a lot of these line bread traits, the cool thing is, I mean, you could look at like koi carp, um, you know, like Japanese koi carp. Those originated, you know, from just selectively line breeding just more brightly colored carp. And then over a period of a few hundred years, they've come so far as to produce all these polygenetic, you know, really, you know, impressive diversities of like, you know, um, colors and everything that, uh, you know, they've line bred to be a particular way, whether it be like jet black ones or white ones that have the orange and black blotches on them. And even ones that are kind of like striped. And so I think it's still in its infancy. Um, I think the hog nose market is actually still early. Uh, believe it or not, it's come so far in the last 20 years. It's completely evolved. It's evolved from, you know, just albinos, pastel pinks, and hypos that were just recently discovered back 20 years ago. And there was locales, and there was the beginning of lion breeding. And so I think that's actually still in its infancy. I think lemon ghost there can be a lot done with them. And that's the cool thing about lion bread traits. Uh, I think they're strongly underutilized and you can actually, uh, you can actually, you could always improve on them. Now there is some things you got to watch out for. I've actually watched people over lion breed and they get away from uh, kind of uh, the, probably the original main goal of the project and it starts working against them. And I've seen that happen with a number of projects and leopard geckos and a couple of times of corn snakes, um, in my opinion. Okay. And so what kind of drew you to that yellow color? Because there's, you could have chose greens, um, reds, um, maybe even like brown. What, what drew you to that yellow to start line breeding that color? Well, there was really no yellow hognose at the time. The closest thing were blondes and the blondes were not really so much yellow. They were more of like a really nice light phase with like kind of like a faded hypo-ish kind of like um, oval pattern. They kind of almost looked like more like, I bet they originated from the, like New Mexico locality hognose. And some of them kind of had like, you know, kind of like a real pale kind of golden yellowish coloration. So they definitely complement, you know, breeding real high concentrated like yellow uh, hognose to them. But there wasn't any really, there wasn't yellows, there was reds. And so that was the big draw. But the, the other big draw was I had the particular animal. That's one thing with line breeding. Um, some people will start trying to line breed from, say an animal that has some qualities that they might want to try to tweak um and so they'll try trying to line breed it line breed it but 
it might work against them because it might um, just be a, a trait that really isn't um, trying to think of the word. It's not very consistent and it's not really that controllable. Um, basically, like, trying to, huh, there, there's some probably decent examples. Some are tougher, like Green Hypo, that's a tougher one. Um, you know, you have reds, extreme reds. Uh, red is a pigment that is more commonly produced, like naturally. So that's a much easier uh, color to line breed. Bright yellows aren't quite as common, so it's a little more difficult. Many with when you get the greens, you can actually go in the wild and sometimes see, you know, hognos that almost kind of look like green hypos. And it's like, okay, they originated from something like that. That's like a wild variation almost that's been line bred and perfected more. And but that one's a little harder one to control because it's usually involves like a lighter base color, like grayish or whitish. And when you outcross it, that can be easily washed away because those are light tones. And if you line breed into something that has more dominant, darker tones that's immediately going to kind of contradict it a little bit. And so, and then the green too is a bit more subtle because like, you know, hognose, they do produce some green pigments, but they don't produce like much saturated green pigments. The most saturated green pigments you're going to find are going to be something like, well, sable increases that, but that's a recessive gene. So by putting something really green or something that's already producing green into sable, you might be able to get the sable to bring that out a little more. And then you have things like lemon ghost because, you know, there's obviously some green pigment to create yellow and you do see some greenish in them. So actually, I think lemon ghosts are among some of the greenest hognose, but it's kind of um, not as apparent because you have that just bold, bright yellow coming through. But there needs to be green pigment in there, too. I mean, you don't really ever see lemon ghosts without, you know, some green. I mean, you get some there kind of just like more like, you know, a real light kind of, you know, subtle yellow.